My father is a Bedouin Arab from an unrecognized village called the, the, uh, the Kohli village. For all his life, he lived in his historical tribal lands, and no one questioned his existence on his lands until 48. Since 48, they became unrecognized village and illegal village. My mother is an Arab Muslim from Nazareth. Even though she came from the strongest and biggest uh, Arab city in the north, she will never identify herself as Nasrawiye, as from Nazareth. She will always say, I am Lubani, I'm Lubaniye. I came from Lubye village, the uprooted Palestinian village that used to exist before 48. My name is Safa Abu Abia. I am a Bedouin, I am an Arab, I am Muslim, I am Palestinian, but I'm also an Israeli. I'm all of these together, but, of no, but I'm none of them. But it wasn't always like this. It all began when my very educated parents decided to remove us, me and my other three sisters, from Arab schools to Jewish schools. My elementary studies I did in Tel Sabah, a Bedouin Arab town near Be'er Sheva. There, according to my parents, that decided that we, the Arab Bedouin girls, should study more about who we are, should know who we are and what is our identity. There, we learn to speak in Arabic language, we learn about the Muslim practices, and we kind of learn about our past so we can know more about who we are. But then my parents thought that, that, that since the level of education in Arab schools are lower than the Jewish one, we should, remove, we should move to the Jewish schools so we can have better chances in life. There, until this point, I knew who I am. I am a Bedouin Arab living in Beersheba. Being in Jewish schools never affected me. I looked like them, I felt like them, I dressed like them, I even spoke like them, or even better than them, so they told me. <laughs> but I felt different, especially in the historical classes, where I was the invisible or the enemy, where I study about the empty, the, the Israeli narrative that said the empty land of Israel was waited for hundreds of years to be redeemed by the Jewish people. So where am I? Who am I? Where is my people? Where did I came from? I took this question and started a journey, a journey to myself, to know where I am and who am, who am I and where do I belong? I took this question and went to the university. There, in the Middle Eastern department, I start to feel that I do exist. Between Arab friends, I start to speak the Arabic language to study about my Muslim religion and to know more about my past. Hey, I do exist. I am here. I do have a past. I do have a place. But where is the Bedouin community? I couldn't find them there. Nor in the Israeli formal narrative, neither in the Palestinian formal narrative. So where is their silent voices? And what can I do to document these voices? I took this question and went to anthropology, studying for my masters, interviewing Bedouin men from 48 generation about their past, about their historical discourse. There, I was exposed to their his very rich historical discourse that they told me about the way they used to live in their historical lands, the way they were expelled in 48 from them, the way they are yearning to these old lives, but I couldn't find the Bedouin women. I couldn't find Bedouin women voices. I've decided to dedicate my PhD dissertation that I just submitted, trying to find out, is there a hair story among the Bedouin women society? Every Bedouin man that I met used to tell me, you won't find any history among these women. Women can't tell you history. We can tell you history. There are lots of Bedouin men in 48 generation that can tell you history. You won't find your answers there among women. That makes me more curious. The Bedouin women that I met from 48 generation actually react the same way. They told me, history? We don't know anything about history. It's men's job. We, don't, we didn't participate in the struggles in 48, in the 48 war. 
We used to occupy in our, home, in our homes, in our houses, with our children. We don't know to tell, to tell you any kind of history, but you know what? My husband can tell you history, and also my uncle can tell you history, and my brother can tell you history. This is for men. You will get your answers there. I wasn't satisfied from these answers. After finding what the right successful formula to get enter to these gender spaces, to these safe spaces where women were sitting down and telling their history to their daughters through their granddaughters, my friends in my age, I succeed to invade these safe spaces. There, I was sitting in this family gathering and hearing themselves speaking about their past. But I was disappointed. There was no history there. There was a fragmented idea, broken language, cuts between sentences, no logic, no you know, chronological logic of event like men used to tell me. I went back to my supervisor. I told him, very, I was very hysterical, terrifying and afraid. I told him, Yoram? He said, yes. I said, don't ask. We don't have a research. We don't have any dissertation. I'm wasting my time. Why? He said, because women can't tell history. Safa? Yes. He told me, Safa, please sit down. He was very calm. You know, Safa, you remind me, my Western academic students. OK, this must be good, I thought. <laughs> Then he told me, you know, Safa, you are thinking in a very specific logic, uh, uh, in a very specific scientific logic, Western logic way of thinking. And you want to impose this way of thinking upon this woman. This is a fragmented uh, society, a survival woman. A, they, this is oral society. What did you expect? So they present all history in PowerPoint for you? or they welcome you and accept you to their internal uh, 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 tribal uh, history. It was really shocking for me how much I internalized the Western perception. I was educated to do so. I changed the way I'm th I was thinking, changed my perception, and getting back to this woman with a very open-minded. In this family gathering, I try to hear what they are saying and also what they are not saying. What is, what is the subtext of this woman? And then I heard a very rich historical discourse, very empowered one. I heard them speaking about the past, the way they used to live in their old life, in their historical lands, the way land defined their gender identity, the way they used to have an active rule running their household the way they were expelled from these lands, and the way they feel emptiness, the feeling of emptiness they feel today as irrelevant, as unattached to the, to the life today because they don't have these lands, the way they are yearning to their old life. Also, they were talking about how they used to take their children, especially their daughters, to their old historical tribal lands. They were used to show them where they used to live. They used to shame them the remains of their houses. They used to tell them, to, to tell them about their old life there. They used to walk barefoot on their lands so they can feel it, they can touch it, they can see it, and they know that this land belonged to them and they belong to this land. And they came from this land and they need to come back to, to it. I learned that history is not about chronological event, linear chronological event. I learned that history is all about people. History is about people telling about their lives, about their feeling. Actually, this is a whole journey of mine, looking for a definite answer, for one identity, for one place, for one narrative and one history that, can, that I can feel that I do belong, that I have one place that I can include me can let me know that I do belong there, that can let me know where I came from and where I'm going. But I didn't find any definite answer. Actually, I came out from this journey very confused. I, even though I was looking for boundaries 
today I know that I'm sitting on the boundaries, that I can't belong to one narrative. I can't be locked in one history. I can't be belong to, to one place. I belong to more than one place, more than one history, and more than one narrative. But you know what? Knowing that there is no definite answer, no definite truth, and no definite justice, actually release me from, the from struggling with myself. Thank you.